Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lunch and Learn session. Uh, we'd like to thank Rodian Schwartz, their sponsor for the Defense Forum today, and they give you everybody the lunches, and we're uh, available today to uh, have a Lunch and Learn session. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Leander Humbert as the uh, Technology Manager of Radar at Rodian Schwartz, and today he's going to discuss addressing the test challenges of next generation radar in EW systems. Thank you, Pat. So, welcome from my side as well. I just have to start the presentation. Give me a second. Here we are. So today I have uh, basically three challenges. The first challenge is that uh, you obviously are all hungry, but I, hopeful, I hope that you can deal with this having the lunch back now. And the second challenge is basically that I'm doing this presentation on behalf of a colleague, and it's always a little bit harder uh, to do a presentation that you didn't prepare yourself. And the third challenge, which could be a challenge basically is that a lot of the topics that I'm going to touch today have already been mentioned. For example, Mr. Brandhorst von Henselt showed a lot of the trends that are going on uh, in radar and EW as well, I would like to say. And I'm going to take them up a little bit. Yeah? Um, I'm, keeping, I'm keeping the presentation a little bit fluid. So I'm totally fine with having any questions in between if you, if you want to. So we have the time, you have your food, and uh, I have a presentation I do for the first time. So, okay. Uh, I'll start a little bit, a little bit with uh, the market and industry trends. And one thing that I personally don't like so much about having this presentation here is my colleague is from the US side, yeah? Uh, so, uh, when you look at the uh, 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 projects that are ongoing, uh, they are mo mainly coming from the US. Yeah? Of course, you can translate this to what is going on in Europe, and I try to, to find the bridge for that. So, another thing, and that I think is, uh, uh, is universal, is coexistence, um, that we're going to dive a little bit into, and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yeah? Big buzzwords to begin with, but we heard there are a lot of applications available for radar and EW to utilize this technology, uh, for example, in a cognitive radar. But the question is how to test it, actually. Um, and was, what we also heard is about uh, transmit-receive modules becoming more digital, becoming scaled up in terms of single modules or channels that are available for every uh, antenna array at the end of the day. And uh, the next topic, again, is a topic I rather would see in the US. Yeah, it is a topic, having hypersonic missiles being a threat, but honestly, how many over the horizons radar we have in, uh, in Europe, I would say, I, I think UK might have one. Uh, I think for the rest of the world, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> uh, from the scale having, let's say, about an aperture of one kilometer, something like that, and a power plant only to supply the over, of the, over the horizon radar is a little bit too much. But we're going to touch it a little bit, and um, let's say, uh, for me, the threat that this has to be countered uh, with over the horizon radars, the hypersonic missiles, is of much more interest. And uh, last but not least, I'm going a little bit into the complexities. We heard gallium nitride um, technology is one of the enablers for having these wideband front ends, yeah, together with uh, ADCs and DAC uh, that provide uh, sampling rates uh, that can do something with having so much analog bandwidth. So, for the market trends, and as I said, we heard a lot of this already, uh, is that we're going into a joint all domain uh, command and control, yeah? that you're going to fuse all information in terms of a network-centric warfare that are um, available to have a, a common situational awareness. And when you have that on the sensor side, you of course have it on the what I'm going to do against it side. So this also translates into a multi-domain electronic warfare. Cyber networking on the other side, when you're going to have a, a platform independent sensor network, you're of course going to have some communication in between the sensors. 
And this uh, network, of course, needs to be secure as well. And this is something that, um, yeah, was something of a hype in, in the 80s, but is now to emerge again, is, of course, space as an EW domain, using satellites, jamming satellites, and so on. Okay, the next points, I would say, are rather focused on the US. But uh, the end of large monolithic programs, from my history, I have, um, let's say, the gut feeling that even uh, in Europe, the governments are driving cooperations into cooperating, yeah, uh, uh, beside um, competition. Normally, when I look at the European uh, Defense Agency, it's, uh, I think, one of the platforms of aligning the companies in a common direction. And I, uh, therefore, I would say the end of large monolithic programs where you only have one prime being involved in the development um, are, yeah, uh, are being changed in Europe as well. And, and of course, yeah, the big, the big hyper threat, uh, the, the hyper hype, I would say, is um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cogn uh, uh, cognition. And there is a lot of, um, when, when, I, when I look at, at the other conference parts in RADAR, um, there is, I would say, one of the biggest um, research field that is going on is not so much on the analog side doing new front ends, but there is a huge amount of research going on in algorithms. So, putting it together in terms of technology trends, Conversion, uh, convergence that we already mentioned, that you're going to have um, front ends or, uh, or um, uh, multifunctional front ends um, available that, are not co that, that not only can be used for radar, but also for communication and EW application as, as well. And that translates to uh, the frequency extension. Yeah? Uh, we're going to have, um, especially for, for communication, um, uh, uh, new frequencies in D-band or here in W-band are going to be available. For me, still the question is, what are we going to do with it? Yeah, it's, when I see 90 gigahertz, I think about a fuse, a uh, radar for fusing. Um, the question is, at the end of the day, do you see any applications uh, having, having these high frequencies in, in yeah, let's say, other applications than the very close range radars? But the increasing bandwidth and the one thing is, of course, the instantaneous bandwidth. Um, but uh, I think the much more interesting part is uh, the agile bandwidth, having a frequency hopping radar. Um, when I translate these bandwidths into range resolution, I think two gigahertz are normally should be enough. Yeah, I don't know if you need to meet, uh, need to meet a millimeter uh, range res resolution um, unless you want to do some imaging. Yeah, so SAR perhaps be going in that area, but I never heard of a SAR system at eight gigahertz on a sleep bandwidth. But for the agile bandwidth, um, I think uh, the next generation, for example, of airborne radars are going to cover the full X band yeah? um, with an instantaneous bandwidth of, let's say, up to two gigahertz, jumping in between um, six gigahertz of non instantaneous bandwidth. And this, again, we heard already, full digital beamforming, having a digital transceive modules, so all a highly integrated um, uh, uh, transmit and receive modules, enable every degree of freedom, so multi-beam performance, having um, waveform adaptivi ad adaptivity, or um, uh, changing the frequency on a pulse-to-pulse -pulse basis. Uh, Again, gallium nitride, white band gap devices are replacing the, the, the legacy structures. And I would say in the past, we, uh, gallium nitride is not new. Uh, I, I would say it's, it's uh, out there for the application in the last decade. But now it's uh, together with having this high sampling rate uh, 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 ducts and ADCs. And that is bringing us to, yeah, as, as an enabler to cognitive radar. And we heard this also, multi-channel EW. Um, and this is I'm, something I'm going a little bit more in detail when I'm talking about uh, coexistence. Uh, the spectrum is uh, being more and more cluttered. Uh, for example, the radars are having uh, more and more or higher and higher duty cycles. And the pulse count, for example, for an 
uh, EW system, for an ESM system, is uh, uh, rocketing high. Yeah, I think that is, that is the challenge of the future, to deal with the high spectral density and the pulse amount uh, that we now have to cover. And of course, all these leads, cognition, uh, cognition um, here and there, uh, it all leads to increased compute, uh, uh, computational requirements. Uh, you need to transport all the data that you, that you produce with your TRM modules and your transceivers, uh, talking about uh, high-speed serial data buses, and even if you do data reduction, somewhere you have to process it. Uh, process it. Again, a US example, but you can, can, uh, can translate it, uh, this to a lot of European radar system as well. I think the key message here when we're talking, uh, talking about the uh, IN uh, SP, uh, SPY6 is, uh, yeah, uh, about 20,000 TR uh, uh, elements. Yeah? And that's, that's the thing. The, it scales up even for airborne platforms. I think we are at the point of, of correct me, 9,000 element -ish, something like that. So even there we have uh, in, in the, um, uh, uh, close to 10,000 TR elements. And this has to be tested on an element level. And now we come to the point that we, uh, in, the, in the past, we had one, uh, one solid state transmitter yeah, that we had to have to test. And then we have some antennas that needs to be tested in the far field. But now we have all these uh, elements that have to be tested and calibrated individually. And at the end of the day, you went possibly to test um, the whole antenna, which brings up very new challenges. Uh, when I look at the size, I would say, what is it? Uh, oh, I can't see it, but I, I, I would assume something at least five to five meters. <laughs> at least. I would rather say ten to ten, but whatever. So, coexistence. I, I would say coexistence, I can, could separate into three domains. The um, uh, having a jammer, yeah, so a, a willing participant that wants us not to see anything. Uh, then we have interference, uh, unwilling, yeah, that just happens due to malfunction or something like that, um, where I also would put co-location issues on. When I look at the naval or at the airborne platform, um, you have your UHF, VHF, HF uh, communication, you have your jamming systems, uh, uh, you have your navigation radars, you have your fire control radars, you have... Uh, your, perhaps your, your early warning radi radars for airborne. You have um, ESM systems as a receivers, comms, a comment system as receivers, and all this have to uh, work together. So co-location and interference are closely related. But when it comes to coexistence, uh, it is for me, it's a more, let's say, a more um, uh, uh, commercial um, discussion at that point. In wartime, I, I think uh, at the end of the day, the system has to operate. But in peacetime, taking into account you standing in a harbor with your ship and you getting an LTE transmitter. Yeah? And that forces you perhaps to have your L-band radar um, to operate differently, talking about spectrum management. And this is going to be an issue. And this is uh, bidirectional. Our radars can be influenced by commercial systems, and commercial systems can be influenced by our, by our radars. Uh, the, latest, uh, the latest incident I have in mind was uh, coexistence of radio altimeters and um, uh, the new, the, yeah, exactly, <laughs> the new, the new uh, 5G frequencies. And uh, this worked out in a way that we had to do band passes in the radio altimeters. And a little bit longer in the past, we had an issue having with LTE and um, uh, air traffic control radars, yeah? where there has also been um, um, made sure that both uh, systems can be operational at the same time. Yeah, so having a look at how it is at the moment. Yeah, we have a regulation at that point that says this service operates here, and this service operates here, which normally is very inefficient yeah, in terms of, of spectral efficiency. So for a future approach, um, and that is where it comes back to, let's say, cognitive radar, 
It could be that you adopt your waveform to what interference or to what other, th other services are now at the spectrum visible and adapt the waveform to it. So a much more dynamic al allocation of spectrum to improve yeah, efficiency at the end of the day. And again, US example, but uh, I, I would say it's the same here. Um, DARPA has exactly stated that, that, um, that they want to have um, radios with machine learning capabilities to improve this coexistence, uh, coexistence topic. Yeah? And that is, yeah, as I come from Rode and Schwartz, I, uh, I would say I'm here coming to the point where I give a little bit about the measurement setup. Coming from the one side, uh, how is our radar affected by um, a different service? And this could be approach where you say you have a radar target generator providing a reference target yeah, with a given signal to noise ratio. And then you could do two ways. You could use a signal generator inducing the same, the, this signal into your, uh, into your receiving path and have a look how it influenced this reference target. So a synthetic, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, communication signal, for example, would be the one approach. The other approach is uh, that you say you're using a recording. You go out with a receiver in the field, take a recording at a given location so that you really have everything together, taking a wideband receiver for it and bringing it to the lab, and then do the same, having a reference target and replay the recorded, uh, the recorded um, uh, uh, environment so to say. The thing is here, a radar has no intrinsic report metrics at that point, yeah? So the only thing that you have is you know that the signal to noise ratio is potentially going down, yeah? This is a difference to having a look at the other side. So if you're facing the issue that your, uh, that your radar, for example, has some hassling hazel with, uh, uh, with wireless, for example, um, here, the approach would be that you say, I'm establishing uh, the communication link, in this regard, LTE, for example. And normally, these uh, devices have a built-in uh, figure of merit, yeah? like um, uh, all these service metrics, uh, 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 starting from EMV um, up, to, uh, up to drop calls and so on. And that is where, um, where you would, could use a radar signal um, coming from a signal generator yeah, to make sure that it is, um, uh, 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 that the coexistence or that, that the regulation is uh, in, uh, in, yeah, in pace with, uh, with the device under test. So basically that would be something I would show to a telecommunication provider. Okay, so far for coexisting, coexistent text, oh, give me a second, coexistent Existence testing, awesome. Next point would be cognitive radar and EW. And uh, as I said, um, cognition and machine learning and artificial intelligence, when, when I look into the media, are so big buzzwords. Yeah, at the end of the day, they are tools. And when I l look at it, uh, it often has to show if, uh, if these approaches are better than the classical approaches. <laughs> it, it depends. But there are certainly some fields where they have an obvious advantage. And um, one is, I think we saw it already, everything pattern recognition. So for um, either for ESM applications or ELINT applications, yeah, basically normally you don't know what you're looking for when you do ELINT, but, but with ESM you do, yeah, hopefully. Or on the other side, when you have a radar, and um, you have a target uh, that you want to classify, yeah, as a classifier at the end of the day, uh, using high resolution waveforms or uh, synthetic aperture imaging, whatever. Um, yeah, I don't think I have to go into the continuous loop because it was shown already. Um, yes, and the thing is, coming from the perspective of the radar. Cognition means I can use every degree of freedom. I can change my frequency, I can adapt my waveform, I'm not stuck into some PRI patterns. And that is a real challenge for yeah, radar warning receiver, for ESM receiver, because what are they looking for? Yeah? Um, it's a little bit the, 
the, the, yeah, the, the death, I would even say, for the classical thread library. Um, you still need it because uh, the old radar systems are still out there. They're not going to vanish. Um, but the next generation of radar system, uh, systems are um, going to be a tough challenge. And that is where, let's say, cognitive EW kicks in. You're possibly not looking for structures, but you're looking for patterns. Yeah, you have to have a test system that for that not give you a, a strict pulse structure yeah, with a given pulse width or whatever, but you need to have an adaptive system to test your adaptive system. And for that, um, I don't know, I'm going to take that one. For that, the same applies uh, as I uh, showed um, uh, for coexistence testing. You can have two, yeah? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 I think the big challenge for you at, is um, we're not doing, you know, when, when you're in Google and, uh, or something like that, when you want to enter a site, you often see uh, some pictures showing which, which is a traffic light. You're doing data labeling. And when I transfer this to, uh, to our domain, first, we lack, we, we lack big data. Yeah? Uh, for, for signatures as well as for threat libraries. We lack big data. There are data, but I wouldn't say they are big. We lack labeling, looking into a recording and having an understanding what is going on needs decades, decades of experience, yeah, and, and, and weeks, weeks of work. So that, that is the big, the big challenge. Um, but, but that is also, let's say, a way of dealing with it. The first thing is you do your own uh, synthetic um, signals yeah? and do variations. That is, that is done in, in, uh, in image uh, recognition as well. You do variations, you play with it, and increasing the richness. Or you record, you take what you have at the end of the day, perhaps only for validation. Yeah? And that is something you probably know better at what, uh, at what point you need to have training data and at what point you want to start to use validation data. But at the end of the day, these are yeah, the two approaches I see. Make your own data or use the scarce, scarce data that you have. Yeah, that is basically uh, what I said now about the imaging and, uh, oh no, I forgot to mention a big other field where artificial intelligence can of course be used is not so much in pattern recognition but into uh, resource, uh, or resource management, scheduling, yeah? especially when I hear about these multifunctional front ends and you're having different services using the same power uh, the same time slots, yeah? uh, you, need, you need to have a very adaptive system uh, that says now this service has priority or this and this has to be situation dependent. So it's not adaptive in the terms of I have a given schedule, but I need to have a schedule that fits to the situation. Ah, fingerprinting, we already heard. Um, perhaps you can give me a feedback. Isn't fingerprinting that? Is that something we still do? I, I thought, I thought uh, due to the solid state amplifier technology going on the, uh, on the slopes of pulses would be very hard. So I'm, I'm curious if, if this in the future still will work that you can say this is this given system, yeah? <laughs> not only the class of it. Yes. And you see the similarity here where you could use such an approach where you have a recorder with several data sets, and that is something where I had the discussions with my colleague, because um, we have here the hill testing, uh, hardware in the loop. And for me, for my understanding, hardware in the loop testing normally is real time. Yeah? You have doing your system doing that, and then the hill system goes directly and does something uh, to deal with it. Here we're talking more about uh, a manual hardware in the loop approach. So you can, for example, you test one waveform and then you see how your system reacts to that waveform and then you can change the waveform to see how it does. So it's not, it's not really a loop at the end of the day, given that you are sitting there and doing the manual attunement. But uh, that is one approach uh, to test or to, or at least I would say validate and test um, cognitive systems.
using synthetic data, or as you can see, um, the black box below, it's a recorder using real world data. Transmit receive module testing, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, I only was here at, I think, at 11 o'clock, so I haven't seen uh, the presentations before, but I think something similar to this uh, was already presented. Yeah, we have a, a shift of the digitizers, let's say, from the very back end to the antenna itself or to the TR module itself. So integrated into it. And talking about integration, I'm talking about into the mimic structure of the, of the module itself. And that poses a real threat. Uh, and I think I actually saw the benefits uh, that arise from having a purely digital transmit-receive module or digital transceiver, whatever term you prefer. Um, but in terms of measuring these devices, we now have an issue. In the past, transmit-receive modules could be tested using a network, a, a network analyzer, yeah? putting some RF in, getting some RF out, measuring S parameters, and being happy with the transfer function that you get. Now the back end of the TR module is digital and the front end is analog. <laughs> And that makes it harder. Yeah? So new approaches of testing these TR modules are required. Unfortunately, if I want to go into detail uh, for what we're doing in that regard, it would, I, I think it would uh, uh, kill today's session. So feel free to, <laughs> to come to me and we can have a bilateral talk about this. But um, we, we are aware. Yeah? We are aware. And uh, I think one of the biggest differences is in the past, we used scalar measurements, yeah? having, let's say, CW as a stimulus. Now, with having high sampling rate um, um, ADCs and DAC, having gallium nitride, and having this totally degrees of freedom, we're using different waveforms. Yeah? We, we're not stuck to, let's say, a Barker code. We are not stuck to having LFMOP, yeah? also chirps on pulse. Um, we can do everything, basically, what we want to have on the pulse. And that brings up new challenges that I would say weren't in the past, like digital pre-distortion. Pre You're now having a very wideband signal that is not sweeping through frequency, but has an instantaneous frequency of a couple of hundred of megahertz, perhaps. And for the amplifier, this poses also uh, 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 yeah, a new challenge, at least from, from radar perspective. That is something where our communication colleagues, of course, have more experience. Okay, and the thing is highly integrated, perhaps to the point that you have antenna on package, which are, let's say, not normal for automotive radars, but it goes into that direction. Personally, I doubt that uh, our radars are going there anytime soon, at least the larger scales one, but uh, the thing is, uh, OTA measurements, over-the-air measurements, are going to be of much higher relevance uh, than in the past because you, you, you lack uh, a lot of the measurement points because you have these highly integrated PCBs or mimics at the end of the day and it's very hard to, to measure actually beside what you get out of, uh, of the front end. Okay, over the horizon radar. As I said, it's, it's nice, yeah? <laughs> I, um, it's no new technology. I think we have still uh, some uh, VHL, no, not VHL, long wave communication for submarine communication being a kilohertz range. Here we are now for, uh, uh, 3 to 30 megahertz, yeah, and using basically not a direct um, um, uh, uh, field. Um, uh, yeah. Field of view, yeah, no. Um, Oh, th thank you, thank you. Direct line of sight, but using uh, sky waves that use the ionosphere as a reflector. And these are basically thought as having an early warning approach for hypersonic missiles, which leave normally very low reaction times for an ESM system and for an ECM system or for a hard kill or whatever to protect especially a naval platform. And these uh, OTH radars uh, can cover thousands of kilometers but, or two buts, uh, the first one is they are very, uh, not very accurate, 
Yeah, we're talking about hundreds of meters of resolution cells, yeah, and elevation. I just heard, I was in Gdansk uh, uh, two weeks ago, and there was a nice presentation um, uh, from, um, uh, from US Air Force uh, that wanted to show how they can improve the elevation resolution of these radars, and we're still talking about hundreds of meters. So um, they are very inaccurate, and they are huge. Yeah, we're talking about apertures here. I don't think we've written anything about that, but hundreds of meters up to kilometers, yeah, where you have every, every uh, yeah, 100 meter, you have an antenna element, and you need to really to have a, a power plant only to supply the energy for, for these radars. So I don't th uh, see these OTH radars uh, around every corner. Yeah? But, yeah, and that is something I don't have a slide here, the threat for it, or let's say the technology that they should counter, I think we also in Europe try to engage, and that is hypersonic missiles. And of course, hypersonic missiles mainly are an issue of the rocket motor at the end of the day, but especially for the sensors, and that is, uh, that is a, an issue that was uh, known from, uh, let's say, from, uh, from the space age, from, from let's say, the, 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 the rocket programs, was called the plasma blackout, the plasma sheath that builds around the vehicle due to the tr tremendous uh, speed of the vehicle and uh, um, uh, the heating of the atmosphere. And that led to uh, um, uh, a plasma blackout. You're losing basically uh, the lo local thermal, uh, 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 thermal dynamic uh, equilibrium and everything changes. Yeah? And the point is if we want to build this technology, if we want to go into hypersonic missiles, we have to deal with it. Yeah? We have to deal it with our positioning systems, we have to deal it with uh, the sensors on board of the missile, and we have to be deal, with, deal with it when it comes to, uh, to the um, uh, communication systems of the missile. So that for me is of much more interest be because I think there are some programs going on in Europe that try to go into the hypersonic missile direction. And gun tests, yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned a couple of these uh, stuffs or, uh, stuff already, so we are now going from scalar measurement to vector measurement, and we're entering some stuff that we, that we knew basically from communication signals, like talking about um, digital pre-distortion and um, power added efficiency. Yeah, we, we're still working at the saturation point of the, uh, of the amplifier, but now um, we're getting a big distortion because we have these wideband signals. And another, uh, another point uh, I think we have to deal with um, these wide band gap devices is uh, pulse stability. I, um, I played a little bit around with having a high power gun amplifier and it's funny to see that the first couple of pulses when you have a burst st structure are very phase unstable uh, before the memory effects, the thermal effects um, come, uh, come back and you have them stable again and I think Correct me, that is something which could be a challenge in designing the actual, receiver, or the actual um, uh, MTI uh, algorithms at the end of the day. Okay, I think I'm nearly done. Yeah, gun test, load pool measurements. If you want to know more about it, with it, the Rod and Schwarz booth. And that is uh, the advertising slide. Come and visit the Rod and Schwarz booth. So, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the lunch session and uh, yeah.